Great. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming on time. It's nice to have you here and being able to start when we said we were going to. And good evening, everybody on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. It's exciting to have you guys here with us on YouTube Live as well. Tonight, we're excited to talk about synthetics, treatments, and assembled gemstones. Now, what does this mean? Well, synthetics are gemstones that are grown in a lab. And they have quite a significantly different price. So Tanya is going to be sharing with you how they're grown in a lab and also what you can expect to pay for some of these things um, and what you should be asking when you're going to stores and asking, is it real? Then we're going to talk about gemstone treatments. Gemstone treatments are things that will take natural gemstones and make them look much better. These are very, very common in our industry, and it's very important that you know what to ask for, because otherwise people will just say, hey, this is a standard thing. Uh, I thought everybody knew about it. So it's important you should know and ask about the gemstone treatments and know how they affect the price of your gemstones as well. And then finally, we're going to have one other thing that we want to share with you, which is assembled gemstones. And that's where you have a gemstone that's made up of multiple pieces. Now, sometimes assembled gemstones can be done for good, like when you have opals. Opals are very fragile, and assembled gemstones give you a much more um, reliable uh, gem that you can wear comfortably without worrying about it breaking. Um, but then they can also be used for evil in the sense that sometimes people will put um, gem material on the top so that when you test it, it looks like a gemstone, but then underneath they might put glass or they might put other interesting things. So all of this is what we're going to be sharing with you this evening. And who's going to do that? Well, Tanya Seydau is the founder of JDMIS. And Tanya has been in the jewelry industry for over 40 years. She has been in every facet of the industry. She's an award-winning designer. She's a bench jeweler. Uh, she's an educator. She's worked in wholesale and retail of uh, gemstones and really has a lot of experience and insight to share. The other thing I wanted to tell you a little bit about was our school, because you're here at uh, Jewelry Design and Management International School. Um, this is one of our uh, gem jamming sessions that we do at the National Design Center. But who are we and why are we here telling you all about gemstones? Now, the easiest way for me to tell you about this is to show you a two minute video, because it'll save my voice and it'll be a lot more interesting than me just speaking. Since 2007, since 2007, the Jewelry Design and Management International School has given thousands of people the confidence to create quality jewelry. Established in Singapore, in the heart of Southeast Asia, JDMIS has conducted courses for some of the world's most distinguished jewelry companies, as well as passionate amateurs and those ready for a career in the jewelry industry. Specializing in the jewelry arts, JDMIS provides exceptional education in jewelry design, fabrication, gemology, and business. The tools that students receive from JDMIS on their first day have traveled with many along the road of jewelry making success. Tanya Sado, founder of the JDMIS, is an award-winning jewelry designer and renowned jewelry educator with over 30 years of experience training the jewelry industry. Tanya, with her team of expert jewelry artists and instructors, created the JDMIS curriculum to be comprehensive yet flexible. Small class sizes, personalized attention, and an unmatched support network ensure that each participant leaves with the knowledge, skill, and confidence to succeed in the jewelry industry. Designed for the jewelry trade, training at JDMIS is fast-paced and packed with useful practical information. But with a diverse range of participants, courses are also great fun. Learning at their own pace, participants study the latest information about gemstones and jewelry styles. They gain confidence using the best of traditional and contemporary techniques and learn how to apply each of these skills to their businesses. All JDMIS courses are completely modular and they can be taken individually. For each skill they learn, students receive a certificate. 
and can combine these skills to receive a comprehensive diploma qualification. Graduates in more than 42 countries delight friends and relatives with their unique creations. Many graduates showcase their pieces online and JDMAS's brightest stars operate their own successful retail jewelry businesses, designing and producing exquisite jewelry that enchants their customers. The possibilities are endless. What will you create? Hey, good evening, everyone. Now, um, this is going to be a very tough session for me because to talk about treatments and synthetics, I can probably do it for about three hours. And I'm going to have to condense it all into half an hour. So I'm going to try to talk quickly. If I'm saying it too fast, let me know. Just put your hand up, let me know. Um, so when it comes to all of these things, there's a lot of misconceptions also. And um, I think most people don't really understand what the terms mean. For example, people want to know, how do they know it's real? OK, something real is something that exists. It's there. So it can be natural and be real. It can be synthetic and be real. It can be treated and be real. So it's not really the right question to ask. So at the end of the day, we're going to have to get away from talking about real and finding out whether it's natural or synthetic, that would be the better thing to ask. And a lot of people have a fear of getting cheated, and this is why they come, this is why they want to know as much as they can about the gems and jewelry. And I will tell you that this part here, it's very important to really go to a good reputable jeweler, because a good reputable jeweler has no reason to cheat you. There isn't a reason why he would cheat. He wants you to come back, he wants you to um, you know, bring your friends, bring your family. He wants to do business. So it's not likely that he's going to cheat. So the problem with most people is that people look for a bargain. And when people look for bargains, well, guess what? You can find all kinds of things. And all kinds of things will include synthetics, treatments, and assemble gems. And you will find that some of those are, of course, going to be much cheaper than the natural ones. All right? And it's not a bargain, unfortunately. It is what it is. Um, if, you don't, if you can't see the difference, if you don't know the difference, then there's a lot of people out there that um, may well take advantage. But those are not generally good jewelers. Those are people who are stalls. Those are people who are here today, gone tomorrow. We've got to be really careful about internet, because on internet, there are also people here today, gone tomorrow. It's very easy. I've seen so many people get cheated on internet. Because you take a photograph. It was a photograph with a, a big um, fracture in the stone, but it was tilted at an angle where you couldn't see the fracture. And the guy bought it for $800. And now he doesn't want it anymore because if you look at it, you can see the fracture very clearly. But of course, it wasn't in the picture on the internet. So we do have to be very careful. So let's take a look now and talk about these three. Synthetics were never, ever created to cheat the gem buying public. In fact, the majority of synthetic gem material that's on the market today is actually going into other industries. Have you ever heard of lasers and uh, even laser pointers? I mean, this thing here, it's because it's got a little piece of synthetic ruby inside. So there's a lot of synthetic gem material that goes into industries where people use it all over the world. I would say around about 98% goes into other industries. And a very much smaller percentage will go into jewelry. And out of that, a small percentage of that, a really tiny percentage might be misrepresented. So frankly, if you go somewhere and you get cheated by buying a synthetic gem when, it's, when you thought it was a natural, all I can say is you've gone way out of your way to get cheated, because that's not typically going to happen very easily. So what else? Treatments. Um, these are industry standard today. They are as industry standard as a person putting mascara on, lipstick. You know, we treat ourselves in different ways. Most gems need a little bit of help when they come out of the ground. Nothing comes out of the ground perfect. And if it does come out of the ground perfect, oh my gosh, 
then it better have a certificate that says it hasn't had any treatment of any kind because those are far and few. They're not the majority of gems we buy today. And quite frankly, if you go into a jeweler's store, most everything is going to be treated in some way, shape or form. And if you ask, what do you have that's not treated? Well, they may well have some pieces, but those aren't the pieces that are going to be out there on display. Those are the pieces that are kept very carefully in the safe, in a special area where, of course, it's a whole different, it's a whole different way of making a sale. And assemble gems. Now, some are good. As Alex mentioned earlier, with the opals, it's worth having a triplet or a doublet in an opal because it, it offers protection for the gem. But some, it isn't offering protection it's actually made to cheat. So we'll get to that one and we'll understand, but the one that really is made to cheat, if any, would be assembled material. So let's have a look at a synthetic gem first. So what we need to understand is today, synthetic gems have exactly the same chemical composition and crystal structure as the natural they represent. So that means that even if we were to take all of our testing equipment and test it, it would give us the same results. Synthetic and natural are the same material. The main difference is that the natural material is made by Mother Nature and the synthetic is made in a laboratory by man. Today we can make anything. If we can make dogs and sheep and other things, my goodness, making gems is easy. And by the way, we have been making synthetic gems since the late 1700s. So it's not new, it's something that we've been practicing for a very, very long time. So if we look at the first method ever invented, it's called the flame fusion or Vernoy process. The Vernoy process is just the name of the person who invented it, Auguste Vernoy. And basically um, it was done very early on late 1700s. In fact, they were more successful in the early 1800s. And it was very, very simple. They would put the right nutrients, which would fall through and be heated. There's a lot of heat here. And then it would sit and just fall onto a pedestal and drip by drip by drip, it would build up a little thing called a bull. This is the bull. And um, because it's the same chemical composition as the natural, then it ends up being the same chemical composition. There is only one difference here. The difference is that we don't really have a lot of pressure involved. We have the heat and we have the right chemical composition. So there are some differences. These are the easiest ones to detect if we're going to detect them. And generally, they tend to be very clean. So it's not like you can find a lot of stuff in them. And if you do find stuff inside, then they could be similar to things that you'll find in other man-made material, like gas bubbles. So we would look with a microscope, and we would be able to tell with a microscope, gas bubbles, and also because this pedestal rotates, we get something that's called a curved stri, which is little lines that run through the material. But is it easy to detect? You can't detect it, not by just looking at it. There is no way to detect it. So somebody could show you a beautiful red stone and say, this is a ruby and it could well be a synthetic ruby. And if you tested it, it would give you all the same results as well. This is why we have to ask today. It's so important to ask, is this natural material? So this is the second type of um, typical uh, synthetic material that you find on the market. It is called flux grown. And it's very similar in that we have the right nutrients, but in this one, we actually put some seed crystals. That means little natural crystals that are really tiny. And this is also heated up. And as it's heated, and since it has the right nutrients, over time, about three months or more, we get an overgrowth on the little seed crystal. So it gets get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you get a decent size. And when I say bigger and bigger, we're not, we're not talking this big. We're talking still very tiny little things. Now this was first done in the United States and it was first done by Chatham, who is very famous for the synthetic emeralds. And that was one of the first ones that was ever produced. And again, is it easy 
to look at these and know whether they're synthetic or not? No, especially not this method, because this method has more challenging internal characteristics, which we call inclusions, which look even more like natural ones than the previous method. So it is actually a little bit difficult. You need a microscope in order to do, assess these, and uh, it takes some time to, to grow them. So these would be a lot more expensive than the first method. The first method is faster and cheaper. This method is a little more expensive. Then we have a much more expensive method, which is called the hydrothermal method. Now, why is this more expensive? Well, it was invented a little bit later, but it's more expensive because this has three things. It has the right nutrients, it has the heat, which the other two have as well, but this one has additionally the pressure, which is normally found under the earth, deep where these things are forming. And that means that when we make something with this particular hydrothermal method, that they are going to look even more convincing. And in some cases, they are very, very difficult to tell. And I'll give you an example of how they're very, very difficult to tell. When I started 40 years ago learning about this, they were already making this kind of thing. But in those days, the pieces they were making were still a little bit distinguishable in that you would look for certain characteristics, like if you had a natural Colombian emerald, if you could see a three-phase inclusion, which is a gas, a liquid, and, um, and a solid, and if you saw that with a microscope, because you're not going to see it without the microscope, then it was proof that it was natural Colombian emerald. But today, these things can be made so well that they even have three-phase inclusions in them. So nothing of what we learned 40 years ago applies today. Everything is evolving, which is very, very interesting. So the inclusions, what we call inclusions, are very similar. OK. Um, we need to remember, however, for however very similar they are to the natural material, they are not specifically made to cheat the gem buying public. If you are going to good, reputable places, and if they are selling synthetic gems, then they will generally tell you this is a synthetic. They will even have an option. Look today what we're finding with the synthetic diamonds. Everybody and his brother wants to buy a synthetic diamond today because it's the in thing. And we have lots of people that are now selling synthetic diamonds. And even some jewelers giving their customers the option, you want the natural one? This is the price. Would you like the synthetic one? The price is much less. Right? So remember that the whole purpose of a synthetic gem was actually to give the customer an option to buy something that looks just as good for less of a price, all right? Because if you go back in history, if you go back before synthetics were ever made, the first people who ever bought gems, they weren't just normal people. They were only the people who were very, very wealthy, the kings, royals, the nobles, people who had a lot of money. And they were the only ones that could afford gems and jewelry. And in those days, let's say we go back to 1500s or before that, we had the ones that had money, and we had the peasants, and the peasants had no money. And so if a peasant was even found with a piece of jewelry, they would be instantly put to death. Why would be, they be put to death? Because they could never have you know, bought it. They would only have been able to steal it, and therefore their, worth, their life was not worth living. So sadly, throughout the ages, that has been the case until we got to maybe 1600s, 1700s, when we begin to see the, the uh, middle classes emerge. And in the middle classes wanted to buy stuff. But don't think for a second that the middle classes were going to be able to buy rubies and emeralds and valuable gems. Because they were also way out of their price range, their budget. And so already, the synthetic rubies in the 1700s were made for that purpose because most people couldn't have even imagined to afford something that was natural. So um, the question you need to ask is, is it natural or synthetic, right? And it's never wrong to ask that question, especially not today. 
Had we said 20 years ago, maybe a jeweler would have been insulted if you'd asked him, is this synthetic? Actually, you don't want to go into a good jeweler and say, is this a synthetic? What you want to do is you want to go and say, is it natural? That's a very nice thing to say because immediately he can tell you, yes, this is a natural, he can tell you more. It begins the conversation and you can get some information. But um, certainly don't use the term, is it real? Again, I'll tell you, if you look, in, look it up in a dictionary, the word real means tangible. It means it's the opposite to imaginary. It's there. So all these things can be there, synthetics, treatments, all of these things are definitely there. They're all real, right? So um, when it comes to looking at these things, obviously they are much more affordable than the natural materials. And that's why we have them on the market. And not only are they more affordable, but in most cases they look better, they are more beautiful, the color is more vibrant, the clarity is better, and they're indistinguishable. So if you could get 10 beautiful ones for the price you could get one not so beautiful one, then the question would be why not? You know, you could have a, a nice selection. But ultimately, Everybody wants to know when they buy something, they want to know, you know, what is it? So asking, is it natural or is it synthetic, is important. What about treatments? Yes. Before we go to treatments, yeah. uh, we had a question online from Bella about pricing. Yes. So could you help us understand, uh, maybe just go back a, a, a slide, and could you help us understand what... Uh, we can expect in terms of pricing? I mean, sure. how much is a synthetic gem versus the okay. same natural gem? Let's just take a ruby, since everybody knows ruby, and since ruby is extremely popular. And since ruby was the very first synthetic to ever be produced, well, we had a, a talk on ruby the other night, and we had some pricing guides up here, and we, we see that a natural, let's say a three carat, which is not huge, it's a nice size stone, a three carat ruby, really good color, good cut, good clarity, can easily go today for around about 80,000 US dollars per carat. Wow, that is an amazing price, right? How many of those can we buy? So it's just not affordable for most people. Now you could have a three carat synthetic and depending on what synthetic you choose, if you choose a three carat synthetic flame fusion or Vernoy, Vernoy, Vernoy process, then you could pay in the range of about $80 for the whole stone. Not per carat, but for the whole stone. So, wow, that's incredible. Of course, that would be excellent color and it would be so clean. And if I were looking at it as a gemologist, I would immediately say, you know, that looks synthetic, because if I don't see anything inside it, that's not right. A ruby, a natural ruby is a type two, which means that we typically have inclusions in it. Maybe you won't see them with your naked eye, but if you look with a loop, you'll spot something. So the, the first technique is very cheap and very cheerful and very nice, and you could probably guess that it's a synthetic. But the second and the third one, they are a little bit more expensive, but it's much more difficult to tell. And so if you had the flame fusion, it's not flame fusion, if you had the flux method, or if you had the hydrothermal method, then your pricing is going up to around about $200 for the stone instead of 80. And in for the hydrothermal, you might pay maybe 300 for that one, a little bit more. But $300 for the stone versus 80,000 uh, US dollars per carat. I mean, there's just no comparison. So this is why we have so many synthetics today on the market, because people buy them. People are quite happy to buy them. There is a market for it. There is more of a market for something cheap than there is a market for something super expensive. Yeah. Is that, Thank you. Yeah? Yes, fantastic. OK. So now let's just talk about treatments for a moment, because there are tons of treatments. And you know, every day somebody comes up with a new treatment. And I, I don't have time to go through every treatment that is out there, but I will cover the, the main ones that most people uh, might have. If you've already got jewelry, you might have some jewelry with these treatments. So we said that they're standard practice. That's because these things have been done for years and years and years. This is long before I even started these treatments have been going on. 
And um, when we talk about untreated gems, very special, right? It's like having a person that is absolutely perfect. I mean, do we know what perfection is? And is it possible to have a perfect person? I don't know, but it is not easy to get perfect gems out of the ground. Every one of them seems to need a little bit of help here or there. So um, if we have the ones that come out of the ground so beautiful, then they should have a certificate today. And that certificate should show very clearly that they have, ha they have had no treatment at all. And that, of course, costs extra. And the cost of one with no treatments whatsoever due to its rarity is definitely going to be much more valuable and is going to retain its value. Uh, synthetic stones, they're a dime a dozen, right? We can make them, we can keep making them forever, and eventually they'll flood the market. They're all going to be really cheap at the end of the day. So um, lots of different types of treatments. Let's take a look at some of the ones that we have to cover. So I've picked four, which are very common. There are chemical ones, which are also broken down, which we'll break down for you in a minute. There's surface modifications, very, very common, and that goes back a long way as well. We've got heat treatments, goes all the way back to 2000 BCE. It's not new. And we've got irradiation, which started in the early 1900s, sometime around then. So those are the common four that you find everywhere. So let's talk about the chemical treatments first. So bleaching is a type of chemical treatment, which, as it sounds, you basically bleach the gem material. Now, you might think, oh, what's going to happen? Can it ruin the material? People who do these kinds of treatments, they know what they're doing. They're not going to ruin the material. They're going to make it so that material is sellable. And the whole point of a treatment is to make the material sellable. Because if initially it came out of the ground ugly, then nobody's going to buy it. So that's the only option, is make it beautiful to make it sellable. Now, bleaching is commonly done on pearls. And if you've got white pearls, then the chances are 99% of white pearls are bleached. And if you wonder why are white pearls bleached? Well, because pearls are formed of layers upon layers upon layers of these two materials called conchylin and nacre. This is a secretion from a little creature like an oyster or a mussel. And as they secrete this material, this, this substance, between the layers, we have dark patches. And those dark patches are like what we get on our skin. Sometimes we have birthmarks. Some people have brown birthmarks. Some people have white birthmarks. Some people have you know, reddish birthmarks. Um, if you have any kind of marks on your skin, that is very much what pearls get through their lips. And those will be seen through the lips. So what we have to do is we have to drill the pearl first, because without drilling it, then the bleach will not get inside. Once it's drilled, we have a bucket of water. We put two drops of bleach. It's not a bucket of bleach. That would destroy your pearls. So you then take your strands. They go into the bucket, and they come straight out of the bucket so that that bleach is sucked inside the material. And then your pearls are rinsed so that the outside, you have no bleach on the outside. So it's never going to damage the luster of the pearl. It's never going to do any harm to the pearl. But what it is doing, it's sucked inside, and it lightens up all of those black spots or dark spots that are commonly found in white pearls. If you have colored pearls, we don't need to do that. If you're going to dye the pearls, we don't need to do that. So bleaching is mainly done on those pearls that are going to stay white. We've got dyeing. OK, these things here are dyed. You can see very fancy colors, sometimes very bright colors. The problem with dyeing is that you can't really tell if it's dyed. The only way you can tell these things are dyed is if they have cracks. And then the dye concentrates in the cracks. So if you have concentration of color in cracks, then that's a good indication that it's dyed. But what if there's no cracks? Then you're not going to see the dye. So we do need to ask, when you go to a jeweler, is it natural? Does it have any treatments? Those are the two questions you want to ask all the time. What else? We have oiling. So emeralds have been oiled for centuries. In fact, nowadays they're oiling 
rubies, they're oiling sapphires, they're oiling opals, they're oiling a lot of stuff. Why? Because it works. And what is oiling? Every emerald typically has inclusions. It's what we call a type 3 gem, meaning when you look at it, you will see something in there. And it's usually fairly obvious. It's not something that is difficult to find. Whereas, let's say uh, an amethyst, please welcome. Uh, let's say an amethyst is an example. Hi. Uh, an amethyst, for example, is usually very clean. When you look at it with your loop, you see nothing. When you look at it without your loop, you see nothing. Right? But these, with the loop, you can usually see, but without the loop, you can see as well. So that's why it's called a type 3. Now, if we put oil in those cracks that are very visible, especially when the cracks reach the surface, the oil is denser than air. So what is going to happen when it fills the crack, it makes the refractive index more similar to the gemstone itself. And those fractures running through, they're not filled with air, which is not the same. They are filled with that liquid that is more dense, and therefore they become not entirely invisible, but much less obvious. So this one would be before oiling and after oiling. You could hardly see anything in it. Then we have lattice diffusion, which is interesting because it is where you put gemstones into um, nutrients and you heat it up. And when you heat it up, it absorbs some of those nutrients and that can change its color. It can make it improve the color a little. Sometimes if you have clarity defects, it could even improve some of the clarity defects. And that one is done often on sapphires and uh, other materials as well. And then we also have smoke and sugar treatments, which uh, are done on opals. We have tons of white opal. White opal is quite common. Black opal is not so common. Black opal is the rarer one of the two. And because we have so much white opal, um, we sometimes have white opal that's not so great. And so if we sugar treat it or we smoke it, that means you put it into an area that has lots of smoke. You cover it with um, a newspaper that's been um, soaked in an oil, like a motor oil, then what happens when it's in the smoke, when it's in the oil, or when we add sugar to it, what happens is it turns dark. So it looks like a black opal instead of a white opal. Now, it'll still have all of the uh, play of color, and it's going to be very visible. But Play of color looks much better on a dark background than it looks on a white background. So generally speaking, it's not that they're going to be more expensive. They're not. All these things are pretty cheap. Because what you're, what you're supposed to be paying, you're supposed to be paying for the original material plus the treatment. It's not like we take something that looks ugly and then we make it beautiful and suddenly it becomes the $80,000 per carat thing. No, it doesn't work like that. If this was $12, then it's going to be $12 plus the treatment. And most of the time, the treatments are done in mass. They're not done like one at a time. And therefore, it's going to be a few dollars and cents extra for the treatment. That's it. So generally speaking, those are typical chemical treatments right there. And we have surface modifications which have existed for a very long time. Do you know that you can paint? a cut faceted gem and you can paint it just a little tiny bit on the girdle or on the back of the stone which is the pavilion and suddenly you can completely change its color and it won't be noticeable especially if you set it into a piece of jewelry it could be painted with paint it could be painted with a felt pen it could be painted with anything I mean nail polish is included we have an instance where somebody had um, a pink diamond and they put it up for auction. People went to look at this beautiful pink diamond and that was long before we had synthetic cubic zirconia in colors. We only had synthetic cubic zirconia in colorless. And this person noted the color and he went home and he took a synthetic cubic zirconia, which is man-made material, looks very similar to diamond with the same dispersion, with the same, you know, 
the same um, brilliance. And he put a tiny little drop of pink nail polish and the whole stone picked up that pink color. And he was able to the next day go into the, to the place where they were auctioning the stone. He said, I need to have another look at the stone. And he switched it. And he actually got away with it. This was back in the 1980s. I'm sure that today would be more difficult to do that. But you know, people weren't expecting it. And paint could be literally any liquid which has color. And it can pick up the color. The stone can pick up the color very nicely. Coatings could be foil coatings. They could be coatings like Swarovski has AB coatings that give lots of interesting lusters and lots of beautiful colors. Um, backings, foil backing again. And when we say foil backing, if you think of a foil backing, a lot of people start to think of, well, you know, glass can often have foil backs that give it uh, a nice color. And so when they see something with a foil back, they think, oh, it's just a piece of glass. But way back in history, before we knew how to cut diamonds properly, which is before the 1500s, before we had 57 to 58 facets, diamonds didn't have the brilliance and the sparkle that we expect them to have today. And so what did they do? Actually, they would have flat backs, and they would have few facets on the top. And in order to be able to get the light to bounce back, to be able to see some brilliance, they would actually put silver foil on the back of the diamond. So antique pieces have diamonds with silver foil on the back. And particularly, if you like Indian jewelry, there's still a lot of Indian jewelry today that has that. They call those diamonds polki. They are diamonds. They have flat backs. And they often have that silver foil behind to reflect the light back up. And they still make it. It's a style of setting, which we call kundan style setting with the polki diamonds. So um, surface fillings are another one. This one's a bit more recent, where we actually have a crack or something in the gem. And we don't want that crack to be visible, so we fill it. And it could be filled with all kinds of things, plastic, wax, polymer resins. And today, we can also fill it with glass as well. So would you be able to see if it was a glass-filled stone? It's not that easy. You do need a loop. You need magnification. But it's not that easy to see. Then we have heat treatments. Now, those well, I said date back to 2000 BCE. The Egyptians were the very first people to do uh, heat treatments. And they were taking material that looked like this, which didn't look so pretty. Oh, it's OK, but you know it's natural carnelian. And they were just throwing it into a ceramic bowl. And they were putting the bowl onto a little fire. And with that fire, leaving it there for a couple of weeks just to see what happened. And then when they went to get it, it would come out looking like this. That's how it can improve. So heat can definitely improve or even change the color of gems. So um, for those people who uh, didn't like the original, they were able to heat treat it to some more beautiful colors. And it wasn't so easy in those days to have so many matching ones, because the mining wasn't like we do today. We do a lot of mining today. <coughs> so they had to take a lot of this stuff, and they had to treat it to be able to match it in their beautiful jewelry in those times. Wow. Uh, pardon? Oh, OK. So, um, I was going to say something else about heat treatment. Um, yeah, uh, look at amethyst. We all know what amethyst is. It's a very beautiful purple gem. But please don't think it all comes out of the ground looking beautiful and with wonderful color. Sometimes amethysts come out of the ground with a kind of weak, wishy-washy color that you can hardly see the purple. So what happens when we have an amethyst like that? Nobody wants to buy that. Nobody's going to pay for it. So what they do immediately, they, they just heat treat it. Now, do we always know what's going to happen? We don't always know what's going to happen. But nowadays, we're pretty much, having done as much experimentation with heat treatment, we pretty much do know what could happen. And if you heat treat an amethyst, especially if it's not such a good color amethyst, you can get a very beautiful citrine. Citrine and amethyst are the same family. They're quartz. 
And to date, the majority of citrine is actually heat treated amethyst. Now, before you say, oh no, I don't want to buy citrine anymore because I don't want heat treated stuff, there's lots of ways you can look at it. How about we're not sending people so deep in the earth? Because the reason citrine is the orange color it is, is because it normally comes from much deeper in the earth where the heat is hotter. And therefore, we have to dig much deeper to get those citrines. So am I happier to have a heat treated amethyst that looks as a, that is an, a citrine at the end of the day because we've changed its color to, to um, yellow or orange? And am I happy to say, oh, I'm glad that nobody went down into the earth and, you know, was at risk of dying from the, the difficulties in mining? Maybe that's another way to look at it. So there's really nothing wrong with treatments. They just, they all have a purpose to make the gem look more beautiful than it is. Irradiation, aquamarines are often irradiated. We irradiate them to remove the green because when they come out of the ground, people think of, of aquamarine in this lovely light blue color, which is a beautiful baby blue. But at the end of the day, most of them have a lot of green tone to it. And the more green, the lower the value of that aquamarine. The more blue, the more valuable the aquamarine is. So we irradiate stuff to drive away the green, which is very often. And topaz, this lovely blue topaz, it never comes out of the ground this color, never. So when you see blue topaz, it's pretty much 99.9%. .9 it's been irradiated to get it this blue color. And if they want it even more blue, they can heat treat and irradiate. So we can even do more than one uh, type of treatment on a gemstone. Of course, that's not the best thing to do, because if you heat treat and irradiate, and then heat treat and irradiate, and then do it some more, then your gemstone is going to get very brittle at the end of the day. And it doesn't have the, the toughness that it should. So um, it's, a, it's a real challenge today to identify any treatments. Um, they are very good at doing the treatments. They've had enough practice at doing it that, that we can get uh, very good treatments and you wouldn't know by looking at the gemstone. So it's very important to ask your jeweler. Please don't expect your jeweler to just tell you. And it's funny, I had somebody in class just the other day and I asked, do you expect your jeweler to tell you if a gemstone is treated when you buy it? And the answer to that was, Oh, by right, they should. By right. By right? What does that mean, by right? Do you all believe that by right, the jeweler has to tell you if your gemstone is treated? Okay, it's not food. You're not ingesting it. You're not gonna die from it. <laughs> That's, when you look at food, you are, by right, you have to see what's in that food when you eat it. And that's why you have a label on all the food and you have a date on the food. But there's no gemstone that's gonna kill you when you buy it, absolutely none. So in that regard, if, if I'm a good jeweler and you come into my jewelry shop and I'm gonna tell you the truth and you come and I say, welcome, are you looking for a beautiful gem? Is it for yourself? Is it for a family member? Maybe it's for an occasion and you say, yeah, I'd like to buy something nice, um, and you tell me what you want, I'll have an emerald. Oh, great, I'll take you over to my emeralds and I will show you, and I will tell you, these are very good quality emeralds. These are Colombian emeralds, and every one of these emeralds is oiled. Would you like to see one closer? Now, if I tell you it's oiled, what's your, your feeling there? You suddenly go, hmm, not really. Do you have something else? Sure, please come. Let's have a look at these beautiful sapphires. These are from Thailand, these are from Madagascar. Top, top quality, really nice. All of my sapphires are heat treated. Would you like a nice sapphire? Yes? Oh, don't like the heat treatment. Fine, no problem. Let's go over to the pearls. We've got some lovely Japanese Akoya. We've got South Sea pearls here. All of these are bleached. How about a nice strand of pearls? Are you getting the picture? Then I take you to the topaz and I tell you it's irradiated and I tell you, every gem is likely to have some treatment. And are you gonna buy your gems from me when I tell you the truth? The answer is no, 
you're not. You're going to go next door to the guy that doesn't tell you, and you're going to buy your gemstones there. Now, how is that fair? By right? By right, a good jeweler has to go bankrupt because he tells you the truth? How so does that work? It's not the truth. He just, it's a standard practice. Yeah. Standard practice in our industry is that we notify people when it's especially rare and it doesn't have a treatment. Yeah. Is not withholding. Exactly. If anybody asks, is it treated? The answer is sure. All of the gemstones are treated. Exactly. But I think a lot of people don't realize that. So we have to really be clear that it's the untreated material that is very special. And if you were to tell me, oh, no, no, I don't want anything treated. I want the natural material. Then I'm going to say, ah, OK, now we're talking. Please come into this special room. I have a nice place for you to sit. I have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and some canapes. And I will go to my safe, and I will pull out the things from my safe for you to look at. But that's a whole different price range. That's a completely different story. All right, so don't think that the jewelers don't have. They have the good stuff. But the majority of people are not going to be wanting that price. They're going to be wanting something very affordable, very beautiful, absolutely wonderful for nothing. I mean, not for nothing, but most people are looking for the least expensive things. And they're looking for bargains. And just remember that if you are looking for a bargain, you might find cheap stuff. But it might not be a bargain. And especially if you travel and you go places that um, far afield where not even in your country, you go to different countries, well, you are seen with tourists written clearly across your forehead when you get there. And they can show you absolutely anything and tell you anything about it and sell it to you because they know they're never going to see you again. And you might think you're getting a bargain because you went to the source and you found that thing at the source and therefore the price was so much better because you were at the source. But that is generally not the case. So it's more likely that you either got a synthetic or you got something that was a treated gem, but they just didn't tell you. Yeah. Yes? Before you go on to, um, assemble. to assemble gemstones, uh, we had a question from Victoria about safety concerns wearing treated gems, especially when you talk about irradiated gems. I mean, am I going to get cancer from wearing an irradiated gem? Yes. So, Victoria, don't worry. Um, all gems that are irradiated is a standard practice. They are checked with a Geiger counter. And a Geiger counter is a tool that will register if the levels of radiation are high. And we've never really had uh, any instances uh, in the market where the gems actually get out to the market where they have levels of irradiation that are dangerous. So we, we've never really, actually there is only one time I do remember a cat's eye chrysoberyl that was um, highly irradiated and they made note of it on BBC radio and it went round the world and it was just that one item. But generally speaking they're very careful with the way they do the treatments and they do check to make sure that they are safe to wear. So we don't have to worry about gem treatments today. And the chemicals also, the bleaches and stuff like that? No. Not something that is going to affect uh, your skin, not something that's going, and these are all tried and tested treatments that have been done for a very long time. Yeah. Okay. So lastly, we want to talk about assemble gems. And we said there are acceptable assemble gems and there are not acceptable ones. The acceptable ones are, for example, opals. If you ever go and buy an opal, you might be offered the option of having an opal doublet or an opal triplet. And that's because opals are extremely delicate material. Opals, if you were to drop an opal on the floor, it would shatter into a thousand pieces. That's how delicate they are. So by putting a good solid backing on the opal, and that backing, by the way, is usually chalcedony. It's a natural material. It's not a glass, it's not a plastic, it's not a ceramic. It's natural material. But they put it to add strength to your opal. And a lot of people like to wear their opals, especially if you are born in October this month. It's the birthstone for October. So um, if you're going to wear it every single day, and if you're wearing it in a ring 
or if you're wearing it on a bracelet, if it's on an extremity and it might knock things, then you are better to have either a doublet or even safer a triplet where it has a clear quartz cap on it. So quartz, natural material, opal natural material, the base is chalcedony natural material, three pieces of natural material connected together to provide strength to the material. That's really what it's for. So, and when they sell these, they tell you, this is an opal triplet, this is an opal doublet. They're not hiding it. They're very clear about it. So there are lots of these on the market because opal is very delicate. Now, these are the ones that are unacceptable. And that's when they try to do something funny, like the top of the stone might be a natural material, and the whole bottom of the stone might be a synthetic material. And they, they do make this. These are made. But these are made to cheat. Why are they made to cheat? Because if they put natural material on the top, they know that when people test gems, the most likely place to test is the top of the gemstone. And if you were only to test that top piece right there, then it might tell you this is that gemstone. Or you look, it, you look inside, you see there are natural inclusions in that top piece. So you might jump to the conclusion that it is a natural gemstone. But if you look a little more closely, you might see there's no inclusions in the bottom. And if there's nothing at all in the bottom, then we would test it on the top and we would test it on the bottom to see if there are any differences in the material. So this could be sapphire, this could be synthetic sapphire, or this could be sapphire and this could be glass. And they would have diff the glass and the sapphire would have different properties. Very easy. Sorry, just remember for the people on YouTube that can't see your laser pointer, so oh. the top could be sapphire, okay. the bottom could be glass. Perfect. All right, and uh, this one here is a triplet. We call it a synthetic spinel triplet, typically. The green one. Sorry? The green one. The green one? Remember, is... they can't see your, your oh, hand. Oh, I see. Sorry. So the green stone is a triplet. So when you look at it from the top view, again, it looks like any ordinary stone. You can even turn it around in any direction. You can look at it loose, and you would not see that it was three different parts. So the top part is actually colorless. The bottom part is also colorless. And the middle portion, which is the girdle, that one is usually a colored cement. And whatever color they choose to use, then the whole stone picks up that color. And you can see from the green one that's on the slide, you can see how green that is. It's green everywhere. And when you look at it in every direction, it's green everywhere. You don't see that it is colorless. You have to have a special liquid that we put it into, where then you can detect that two pieces are colorless and the middle portion is the colored portion. So these are the ones you need to look out for. And these are ones that good jewelers are not selling. Good jewelers don't even want to touch any of this kind of stuff. This is what you'll find when you go to very far, you know, exotic places looking for bargains. That's what we get. So in conclusion, um, make sure you ask questions and go to a good jeweler, a reputable jeweler that you can trust. And those questions that you want to ask, is it natural? Has it got any treatments? No harm in that at all. No jeweler is going to get upset with you asking those questions. Those are normal questions today to ask. Definitely beware of bargains. There's a little saying, you get what you pay for. And if you paid a lot less than you should have, then there is a reason for it, definitely. So always buy from a reputable jeweler. You won't have that concern. And uh, someone you can always go back to. You know, if anything goes wrong, you can go back to that jeweler. Fantastic. So, thank you. Do we have any questions? No other questions? So, I just I'll had a, a comment about uh, this because we've had, we had, we finished a, a talk on um, synthetic diamonds, and we had a lot of questions about synthetic diamonds, and this is also on synthetics. Um, one of the key things that I think everybody should remember is that the synthetics and the treatments are making the gemstones more accessible, lowering the price, making it possible for us all to be able to wear and buy and own these beautiful things. It doesn't make them any less interesting, valuable, or beautiful. But there is one thing that it does change, and that's the investment value of these things. 
So a lot of people, when they talk about gemstones, they think also about investment and they think about the value that they're capturing because they're buying gemstones. Synthetics, there is no value, right? There's no resale market for synthetic diamonds, synthetic rubies, synthetic emeralds. Tanya gave us an example of a price of $60,000 a carat versus $60 a carat, right? You're never going to recover that $60 a carat. Nobody's going to talk to you if you try and sell them that, that, uh, that amount. So um, when you're thinking about an investment in a piece of jewelry, the questions that Tanya was suggesting you ask, is it natural and is it treated? That becomes super important when you're spending a lot of money on a gemstone. But if you're buying a gemstone that you love and it's a great price and it looks beautiful and you want to wear it, then it should be great that it's synthetic or treated because it's a better price and you're still going to be able to enjoy the piece. So we're not really saying that synthetic is bad or that treatments are bad. It's just remember what you're using it for. And the only time you really need to be extra, extra careful is if you're going to be spending a lot of money. And then the one thing you need to be extra careful about is who is telling you that it is or it isn't synthetic. Very often we have people looking for a third party to say, yes, I confirm that this is not treated or yes, I confirm that this is not, uh, uh, not uh, that this is natural. And then you would look for a certificate. You would make sure you go out and look at who's giving you the certificate because certificates from some places are more well known and are more reputable than certificates from other places. Thank you. Actually, I can hold on. Great. Any other questions? Yes, shoot. How do we tell if the same precious? It's very difficult to tell because we have heat in the earth and then we can heat something when it comes out. So, so what's the difference? It's the same, right? When we send to Nanya, yes. when we send the precious stone, semi precious stone to Nanya. Okay. So, so when it comes out as a unheated Okay. The gemological labs, they have multi million dollar equipment. All right. That kind of equipment can tell. You know, so they you they have send the gemstone physically to the lab yeah. to make sure that it's not unheated. It's very important to let the lab do it because the lab has the right equipment for it. For us, I mean, even if you just had a microscope, it might be very difficult. I mean, I could tell you, oh, you've got to look at the inclusions. Uh, if it's heated when it comes out of the earth, after it has come out of the earth, you might get inclusions that because of the heat expand and contract, and then they have fractures all the way around those little uh, internal characteristics. And that might be one way to see that it's been heated. But it's not always that obvious. And they don't always look all the same. It's not a very standard look. What so this is why the, process? it's why the equipment is important. Yeah? What about the oiling process that you mentioned? That one, again, you need a very high power magnification. And if you've got the right equipment, you can tell. Then you also have, um, nothing, is, nothing is assessed with one test. Everything they do, they have to do it with several different types of uh, equipment. So today we rely on spectroscopes. We rely on, you know, machines that are easily twenty-three thousand dollars per machine. And any jeweler is not going to afford those kinds of machines. So that's why the labs are super important today. So you can trust a good lab if that good lab has updated equipment then it's of no consequence, they will be able to tell. But if it's a little tiny lab, and if that little tiny lab doesn't have updated equipment, then they could also make a mistake quite easily. Yeah. Um, on this topic, right, in your opinion, how reputable is Nanyang? I mean, of course, it's not GIA, but... Um, um, and that's the easiest, most accessible for us. In Nanyang is one of the laboratories here in Singapore. Uh, it's been here for many years. And I think most of the industry do take their pieces to Nanya. So if most of the industry are taking their pieces there, I would say that you know it is respected here in Singapore. But, but in it, international scene, yeah, interna I, I hate to tell you this, but in some parts of the world, they still think Singapore's in China. Oh, that's yes, so I, Singapore is so small mm. that Nobody knows Nanyang, I mean, internationally. And it's not that easy to get that recognition worldwide. Um,
because there are lots of big players. And you know, if somebody is going to buy something with a cert, they will probably ask for a GIA cert, or they will ask for, you know, there, there's a lot of companies, a, a GRS, um, a Gublin cert. You know, those are all people that have been around a lot longer and um, are international because they've got uh, offices everywhere else. And, and so when somebody is going to buy it, let's say you bought something to then resell it. So if you have a GIA cert or a cert that is very well recognized, and, and people see, oh, I recognize that cert, then the chances are probably higher that you can make the sale. If they see a cert by somebody they've never seen in their lives, then it might be more difficult. It obviously depends on the material. Yes. Yeah, I just want to know, you know the cert usually they indicate uh, heat, heat treated yeah. and all this thing. If heat, the treatment is so insignificant and it does bring out the best of the gems, why are they still emphasizing it in every cert most of the time? Um, it, it's not that it's insignificant. Uh, it's that we have very few gems that need no help whatsoever. And heat treatment is one of the very common treatments that we do to help the gems look better. But if you really get one out of the ground that doesn't need the heat treatment at all, then it's extremely rare. I guess uh, these days most of the gems are being treated yes. for heat treatment. Yes. So why is it this part here, they still need to say that oh, it's not treated, it's treated? Because very unlikely Oh, because the price is going to be different. The but price for an unheated one is going to be much, much higher than a, heat, a treated one. But I guess most of the gemstones in the market are being treated. Yeah, a lot, mm. a, a very high percentage. So that's why it's like um, much more presentable to be in the market instead. So if you're gonna put it in the cert, you're gonna show that the value. Whether again, it's like, would you buy if it's a treated gemstone? But then yet it's it's uh, more beautiful. Well, the thing about the certificates mm. is that nowadays we're seeing a lot more certificates on the market. Mm. When I started. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, 40 years is not 100 years. But we didn't even have certificates for one carat diamonds. Yeah. We, we wouldn't imagine doing a certificate for a 25 point stone. We wouldn't. Today, we have in diamonds, we have certificates all the way down. Even the smallest little diamond can have a certificate. Why? Because more and more people are discovering certificates. More and more people require the certificates because they they feel comfortable if it has the certificate. If it doesn't have the certificate, they're not sure whether they can believe what the person is telling them. So it's just a question of the demand from the public today. The certificates have become something that people request. Now, if, if you have a really, really good stone and you believe it's not treated and you go to the lab and you find it's not treated, obviously then the value is going to be higher. If you have a stone and you get a certificate and it shows that it is treated, well, I mean, why do you need the certificate? Do you really need the certificate for that stone? You probably don't. But it's not going to spell out other the composi uh, composition of the gemstones and uh, like any other treatment, uh, chemical treatments or whatsoever. It's not going to spell out. Can the lab pick up all this? Oh, no, the lab can pick up all of those things today. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, there could be more things, yes. If you really want to break down. Yes, yes, there's definitely. And when you take it to the lab, and have it tested, they are not only going to make sure that they identify exactly what the material is, um, but they will write down all of the treatments if there are more than one. Then that you don't have a, a certificate only to see whether it's heat treated. That's not usually the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So we, we had a question uh, asking about other labs. And I think I want to put a stop to the questions of asking us to give opinions on labs, because we don't. Um, what we can do is we can suggest some ways that you can evaluate labs yourselves um, because it's not really appropriate for us to say this is a good jeweler, this is a bad jeweler, this is a good lab, this is a bad lab. That's not our, our position here. Mm. Um, so uh, Tracy, you were asking about a specific lab. The, probably the best thing for you to do when you're looking at uh, identifying should I go and take my pieces to this lab is have a look and see what certifications they have. Uh, many of you have heard of ISO certifications. There are ISO certifications about the process that they use and about whether or not they're calibrating their machines 
And if they're ISO certified already, that shows that they're following some best practices that are used around the world. You can also ask them what kinds of machines they have. And very often the labs will tell you on their website what kinds of tests they can do. And if they have machines that, you know, Tanya was saying a, a, a typical lab nowadays, if you want to have a lab that can do all of the work that you need to do, it's probably going to cost you in the range of up to a million dollars of equipment just to be able to perform all of those tests. And so if the lab doesn't have and isn't sort of telling you all of the good things about their Raman lasers and about their uh, FTIR things and, and all kinds of other crazy machines that sound very complicated, if they say I have a microscope, then you're probably expecting a different level of uh, a different cost for the certificate and a different level of um, confidence in the certificate that they give you. And very often you can also, if you go and talk to the labs, they might tell you that they do all of these tests, but they might work with other labs to do some of those tests. So very common in smaller countries is a very experienced um, uh, jeweler, that uh, gemologist that works in a lab, may need an additional test if he has a doubt. And then he'll go to another lab and work with them to get that additional test because they have this machine or that person has that machine. So all of these things are good things for you to ask. Um, it's a bit difficult for us or really anyone to tell you this is a good lab or this isn't a good lab. But it's not too difficult like you would go shopping for a gemstone and you know what questions to ask. Is it treated? Is it natural? Uh, when you go shopping for a certificate, also you should know what questions to ask. Do you have any certifications? Uh, what kind of equipment do you use for your uh, lab tests? Maybe even how many years of experience? Tanya said that some of the local labs here have a lot of experience. That makes a difference. Had a question? Uh, so usually, in your opinion, when you're looking at like luxury brands, for example, Bulgari, yes. usually do they use uh, more, do use like, better quality gems, or are, they, are we paying more for the brand rather than the material that they're using? Yeah, I think that, in my opinion, um, I, I actually have worked with a lot of the brands. Um, and I can tell you, I know that people have this misconception that the big brands, you're paying for the brand name. But actually, uh, and not to bring up any names, but a, a few brands that I've worked very closely with, I find that they not only have their own mines, which means they are mining their own diamonds, they are cutting their own diamonds, their perfection in cutting is better than most, and all of that actually ends up giving you a better quality uh, product. So for example, when they have a mine, they're going to keep all the top, top stuff, the best stuff for themselves, and they're going to sell off all the ones that they don't want. So a lot of the other jewelers that might be cheaper are actually selling cheaper because it's not the same quality material. So that's that's one thing. Um, and, and, and I do know that for a fact because I have seen the quality that some of the bigger brands do have. Um, as an example, uh, small stones. We call them melee, little diamonds. Typically, most small diamonds are cut, let's say something that's uh, maybe three millimeters or less, all right? Three millimeters is very small. Um, typically, they are single cut, which means that they will have about 17 or 18 facets on them. And that's the standard for small, small stones like that. But when you come to some of the bigger brands, they have full cut three millimeter stones. That means they put 57 to 58 facets on a three millimeter stone. And you can, you can look at it with your loop. The problem is that when people pick up a loop, they don't see it. They don't know what to look for. They don't notice these things. They're very small nuances. But the value on something that has 57 to 58 facets versus 17 to 18 facets is different. Yeah. So definitely, I don't believe that it's just the brand name. And the other thing I will tell you about that is when something brilliant comes out of the earth, let's say they uncover the biggest or the most beautiful or the best quality, whatever it is, right? The person who unearths it, he's going to pick up that phone 
and he's going to call the Harry Winstons and the Tiffany and companies and the Bulgaris in the world, and he's going to say, do you want this? Because otherwise I'm going to sell it to, my, to, to your competitor, right? And there's no bargaining at that level. That's, they're going to buy it. They're going to they're want it because they want the stuff that's super special, super rare, super valuable. But that, that part nobody ever thinks about, right? People think they're going to go off to Burma or, or one of these fancy countries and discover the best sitting there waiting for them to discover it. It doesn't work like that. It really doesn't. I, I think, Tanya, you're also talking about things that are at a level yes. that most of us wouldn't, wouldn't really even see. Can yeah. ever, ever have access to. I mean, it, we're talking true. hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, for really, really, really rare pieces. Yes. And, and at that level, the only people yeah. that have access to those extraordinary things are the are ones that people. are really operating at that level. Yeah. Fantastic. Good. Any other questions? One more question. Yeah. It's about price as well. Someone brought it up um, about the price disparity between synthetics and uh, genuine stuff. But what about the price difference between something that's treated and depending on the treatment, how? How would we know what is a good benchmark, for example? And different stones have different pricing as well. I just found it really yeah. tough for myself because I spoke to a It's really tough for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like, really tough just for you. When you, you want to know the yeah. price of a gem, it's it's a difficult thing because every gem is unique. You can't say all amethysts look exactly the same. Some have more saturation of color, some have darker, some have lighter, some have right and, and some have more better clarity. So every gem you buy is unique. It's like a person. So it's like gems are like people. So the question is how much should you pay for it? Well we have things that are called price guides. We can always go and subscribe because you don't just get the price guides, a lot of work to produce the price guides. So you subscribe to the price guides and then from there you can actually have an idea of what you're going to pay for it. But the price of a gem is not just that gem, right? It also depends who is selling it, where they're selling it, um, how long they've had it. I mean, there's so many other factors, you know, you've got overheads to consider, you've got GST to consider, you've got so many other things. So it's not something that you can get to even know in your head. If you wanted to really know are you having a good deal on the gem that you want to buy, then you have to go and do the research and you've got to go to every different place and try to compare like with like, the exact same thing. So if it's an emerald, just focus on emeralds. Focus on that type of emerald that size, that shape, because if they're all different sizes and shapes, again, the price is going to be different. So that's how difficult it is. It, it's not an easy thing. So you can either trust the person you're buying from right, and buy it, um, or here's another way to think about it. And I know that you know people are very concerned about what they're paying, but when you want to buy a gem, the first thing you have to ask yourself, do I really love it? Does it excite me? Am I going to want to wear this every day? And what if I, I hold and then I come back tomorrow and the person that I wanted to buy that gem from says, oh, I'm sorry, I sold it. Sold it yesterday. Just after you walked out the store, I sold it. Are you going to feel regret if you miss out on that opportunity? That is a good question. Right? No, we're not talking about price here, but we're just talking about are you going to feel regretful? Now I'm going to come back to the price. Because if, let's say, the price of that gem was $2,000, just if, right? And you absolutely loved it. And then you went, you had it set into a piece of jewelry, and you wore it every single day. And you really got your money's worth out of it. What if I wear it 2,000 days? What's it cost me? <laughs> it cost me one dollar per wearing, right? Now I'm happy. That puts a big smile on my face, right? So it's what you're going to do with it as well. You know, it's, it's how much you're going to appreciate it. It's how much you're going to love it. Um, put, buying a gemstone and putting it in a safe, oh my gosh. I mean, that's like one of the worst things you could possibly do. Yeah. Uh, one 
one question about how about these jewelers, for example, Matt and Gems, uh, when they are, uh, since most of these uh, gems are treated anyways, do they also mostly work with treated gems to create these pieces for their clients? Or do, uh, or do some of them try to go like, oh, okay, I want to specialize in untreated gems? Uh, yeah, some, some jewelers do specialize in that. Um, again, you need to ask. It's something that is very important that you ask. You know, is it natural? Has it got any treatments? Okay. Yes. So I can't, I can't answer for other jewelers, but I can say that, you know, everyone has their own way of, of doing it. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay, I've come across a diamond that actually has uh, uh, fluorescent. Yes. So this diamond with fluorescent and has the K color, kind of like, a, mm. um, they kind of uh, make it look really quite diamond because of the fluorescent and because of the color. Yes. Instead of uh, blessing in disguise, that this diamond. So the value. What about the value of the diamond? The value should be still a K color. K color. K color. So because some of them they're selling, they say, oh look, the fluorescent because of the K color, it turns out to be really white. But in certain lightings, you can still t see the yellowish. Yes. So technically, mm -hmm. when we say white light, if you go outside, you realize we do have, you know, we do have some UV outside, mm -hmm. right? And what you're talking about is a yellowish diamond that because it has very strong fluorescence and the only way it will change like that is if it has very strong fluorescence um, the the fluorescence is blue usually so the blue cancels out the yellow now i actually had a stone like that it was a k color it was a 3.85 it was a very nice size and i sold it to an american lady she wanted a big diamond. She didn't want to pay a big price. And nobody here in Singapore wanted to buy that stone. Nobody, at that time, nobody wanted a K color because K color was like, no, no, we want DVVS. Here in Singapore, people like very high color, high clarity. So um, she liked it. And she liked the fact that when she went outside, it actually looked like an F color. Fantastic, right? So. The problem with that is that in normal lighting, it's still going to look yellowish. Yeah. So you can't possibly buy it at the higher look. What you can do is buy it for the K color, right? And you get the bonus that if you're outside, it looks like an F. So basically, you have to keep running outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically yeah. it. Yeah, there's people in the market selling diamonds like this and yeah. uh, kind of... Uh, but because of the fluorescent. Yeah. yeah, they should not be charging more Correct. because when you go outside, you see the fluorescence. Yeah. Because most of the time, we're not in the type of lighting that will yeah, will do that. Yeah, so you should you should buy it as a K. Yeah, but then yeah. again, it's like if it's K or J color, it turns a little bit yellowish yes. without the fluorescent. They sort of call it the fancy yellow. No. Okay, <laughs> okay, a J yeah. is not a fancy yeah. yellow. I, I think, if if yeah. they're telling you it's a fancy yellow, run yeah. away, run away yeah. from yeah. that place. C careful when they're yeah. telling you that it's yeah. worth more because of the fluorescence yeah. and it's a fancy color Correct. when it's, you're, you're already dealing with somebody that's inventing Correct. different terms to confuse you. Okay, yeah, that doesn't sound right. Um, and definitely fancy isn't until you get down to X, Y, Z. Right. That's yeah. fancy, X, Y, Z. Yeah, so long way to go for right. fancy. Yeah. Great. Great, excellent. We've gone long, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I just wanted to remind you that this is one of many sessions that we run here at the National Design Center. The gem jamming sessions cover things like value factors when you're choosing your gemstones. Uh, we have spotlights on different types of gemstones, so spotlights on pearls or phenomena in gems or rubies or uh, barrels or things like that. And we also have sessions that talk about how jewelry is designed, how jewelry is manufactured, so that you can understand a little bit more what happens behind the scenes. You're more than welcome to join us for these sessions. Uh, we run them here at the, uh, at the school, at the National Design Center, uh, sometimes two and three times a week. And we also live stream them to YouTube, so you can always check them out if you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're interested in something a little bit more structured, so you'd like to know a little more about the gemstones and jewelry and want to go through a training program that will get you much more confident when you're thinking about all of these things, we'd like to share with you our most popular course called Gem and Jewelry Trade Secrets. And the easiest way for me to share that with you is again to play a short video.
You love gemstones and jewelry, but how much do you really know about the rare and beautiful materials that are in your jewelry box? Join me, Tanya Sadow, for a complete hands-on certification that is guaranteed to change the way you appreciate and buy jewelry. Start your journey by traveling to the source. Learn about gemstone origins, see how gems are mined, and how these extraordinarily valuable materials get to the market. You'll learn how to spot good quality gemstones and how to assess value factors for diamonds, colored stones, phenomenal gems, pearls, organic gemstones, and even jade. This comprehensive course gives you the knowledge and power to take control of your gem purchases. If you're a collector or an enthusiast, or your sales process, if you're a designer or a jewelry professional. Beyond understanding about the gemstones and common trade practices in the jewelry industry, you will also see and learn about imitations, synthetics, and treatments that are sometimes used to enhance or even to deceive. This popular course takes place in our Gem Vault, where participants are able to see and examine my collection of over 1,800 gems and jewelry pieces, which include rare and valuable specimens as well as common imitations found in the jewelry markets in the region. You will complete this course with a clear understanding of gem facts and will be able to avoid misconceptions that can lead to expensive mistakes when buying jewelry and gems. Here are some of the topics that we will cover in this exciting program. First, we'll learn about the wide variety of beautiful natural minerals and the many misconceptions which abound in this field, as well as how to classify and compare gemstones. Knowing more about these gems, we then learn to evaluate color, discover how clarity types are assessed, and see a wide range of cutting styles available in today's market. Diamonds are the next on our agenda. First, we'll understand the modern diamond trade and then gain in-depth knowledge about the four C's, which consists of color, clarity, cut, and carat weight, and which will be the most helpful during your next diamond purchase. Next, we'll explore important differences between natural diamonds, synthetic diamonds, and diamond simulants, as well as some tips that will help you in the identification of these gem materials pearls are seeing a resurgence in popularity. Our next stop is to discover the varieties of pearls available and their origins, as well as common imitations in the market and ways to identify them. Pearls also have some unique value factors that you need to know about, such as color, luster, shape, make, naked thickness, and spotting. All of these significantly affect the price of pearls and knowing them can help you make better buying decisions. Have you heard of asterism, chatoyancy, play of color, aventurescence, adulorescence, iridescence, or even labradorescence? These gemstone phenomena make certain gem materials really stand out from other gems, and knowing how to observe and evaluate these phenomena can help you to select the very best gemstone. Today, in Asia, no gemstone course would be complete without an understanding of jade. This popular material has tremendous cultural significance, but it has also been misunderstood for millennia. Learn about jadeite, or feichui, and nephrite, the two genuine forms of jade, and discover the many, many imitations available on the market today. Not all gemstones are minerals. Some gems are produced by living organisms. These are known as organic gems and have been appreciated by all cultures throughout time. Discover how gems like amber, jet, bone, ivory, shell, and even coral are used in jewelry today and what to look out for when buying to ensure your purchases are responsible and sustainable. Our last stop is to understand the difference between imitations, synthetics, and assembled gemstones. Here you'll learn the importance of using the right equipment and techniques to test gems and will appreciate the complexity of the expert field of gemology. 
like all JDMS courses, participants in the Gem and Jewelry Trade Secrets class receive everything they need to fully appreciate the gems, exhibits, and jewelry samples. This includes tools like the Jeweler's Loop and specialized pen lights and tweezers and gem cloths, as well as reference materials for all of the topics covered. Discover the sparkling world of gemstones and jewelry at JD Myers and see the gemstones in your own collection with a new appreciation. Find out more about our most popular course, Gem and Jewelry Trade Secrets, at jdmis.edu.sg. All right, so just to clarify, um, if you are a Singaporean or permanent resident, you can use Skills Future Training Grants uh, to offset your course fees between 50 to 70% of the course fees. And if you're a Singaporean and you still have Skills Future credits, you can use the Skills Future credits to pay for any of the remaining course fees that were not offset by the grant. This is a program that is blended, which means that a portion of it is online and a portion of it is a classroom session. Um, this means that all of the useful things that you might want to refer back to next month, next year, or three, four years from now when you're going to make your purchases, um, you will have access to and you will be able to re return to whenever you need to. But at the same time, doing everything online doesn't give you what you need to really understand and appreciate. So we also come into the classroom and Tanya brings out her 1,800 gem and jewelry exhibits to explore uh, and have people really understand the, uh, the, the process and the gemstones. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you for joining us this evening here, and thank you for joining us on YouTube. Tanya? Yes, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye, everyone, on YouTube. Great. Hello, everyone. This is Tanya Seydal from JDMIS, Jewelry Design and Management International School. I hope this message finds you all really well. Some of you we haven't seen for a while, and we invite you to see this new place that we have. But I have some very exciting news for all of you. Our YouTube channel has been a bit quiet, but it's going to become a lot louder. We've been live streaming our gem jamming sessions through the National Design Center here, and we're going to do lots of very interesting new activities as well. Expect exclusive insights into gem and jewelry topics, more jewelry design tutorials, behind the scenes looks at our school, and even conversations with industry insiders. And here's where you come in. We need your support to make this happen. How could I be of support? I hear you ask. It's simple. Just hit the like button on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to turn on the alerts by clicking at the little bell icon. That's it. And if you want to have more impact, then please leave me a question. I read all the comments and I will surely reply to you. So why does this help? Well, YouTube senses your engagement while you're watching our videos and it uses it to recommend it, the content to other people too. And not only does it help us to grow and to create more free content, but it also ensures that you're not going to miss some of the exciting updates that we provide. By subscribing, you'll be joining a passionate community of gem and jewelry lovers. You'll enhance your skills, you'll learn new techniques, and stay updated with industry trends. So come and join us on this sparkling journey. We'll learn, create, and have fun together. Remember, Every like, every subscribe, every share, every comment brings us closer to our goal. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button and let's make something beautiful together.